Hey Zach I've got a job for you and it needs done ASAP it's critical I've got a table mild steel whole things welded about 4 feet tall by 3 feet deep by 4 feet long tops an inch thick steel plate structures all welded 3 by 3 by 1 16 inch square tubing tops just resting on the tops of the legs at the corners but it's got that same tubing as beams to support the plate on the top needs to hold 500 pounds factor O safety of I don't know 5 I guess. Ain't got a cat yet for yet. But I know you don't need one haha. Ha. Have a good weekend. <laughs>All right, so this introduction is already too long. We have 24 minutes to analyze this thing before design has officially inconvenienced me, so let's make sure we do this right. At times like these, when you're in a pinch, a 3D model is the standard way to convey to your analyst what the structure is that they need to analyze, but sometimes you don't have time for that, so you've got to take what information you do have and always construct a visual representation of the structure you need to analyze. Please resist your urge to create a detailed 3D model in ANSYS COMSOL HYPER PATRAN FEMAP a CUS and allow your pointlessly dense 3D mesh with nonlinear material properties to run until you can retire at the ripe old age of 63 so you don't miss your appointment with the bus that's been waiting to run you over. If you don't start your analysis with hand calculations, you'll have no way to tell if the numbers that a finite element analysis spits out are even remotely correct, which they aren't the gross majority of the time because your dumbass punched in a few of the numbers incorrectly. So suit up, it's time to spread some sheets. All y'all people that can't do math unless it's code can cry me a river. When you manage to write a MATLAB script that updates persistent variables on your screen in real time to let you visually and interactively perform calculations and identify incorrect numerical inputs, congratulations, you've made a worse version of a spreadsheet software. Don't hunt rabbits with a nuclear warhead, always do the easiest thing first. Let me give a brain aneurysm to all the people who are taking a structures class in college right now. Realize, for a moment, that this word problem didn't give you the most crucial aspect of a standard homework problem, which begs you to ask the question, 500 pounds, where? At first this seems like a completely valid question. Every structural analysis problem needs three definitions, the loads, the structure, and the allowables. And part of the loads definition is where the loads are applied, but simulate this conversation real quick. Yes, hello, uh, where on this table are you going to be putting 500 pounds? Alright, wait, no, never mind, that's a really stupid question. It's a fucking table. You can put anything you want anywhere on a table. That's what a table is. So, clearly the answer is to try to analyze the table in like a thousand different locations on the top surface, right? Well, no. But let's roll with that for a second. Engineering is the art form of doing precisely as little math as necessary. And similarly, if we can prove that this table doesn't break, even in the worst case scenario, then we know it won't break in any other case scenario. So now the actual question, what's the worst case scenarios? Or in other words, what load cases do we need to analyze? There's a couple of tricks we can use here. One, look for symmetries. Hey, we've got four of them. Two, look for max deflections. I'm thinking right about here or right about here. Three, look for the path of greatest stiffness. That'll have to be right on top of the leg, right? Four, look for joints. I'm thinking this weld right here. Yeah, that seems good to me. Let's uh, list our assumptions now, clearly for posterity. Say what material you're assuming and what its properties are, say the factor of safety you're using, state your weld knockdowns and if you're taking stress concentrations into account, and state your assumptions about what the welds even are. If you're going to assume they're full seam fillet welds, you'd best say that you're doing that. In fact, for good measure, we won't even assume that this tabletop does anything. It's more conservative if we do that, and it's easier to analyze if we prove the table is fine without the giant one-inch slab of steel carrying any load. That's awesome news. So what do we do first? How about that one on the long side? The basic tenant of all forms of analysis is to reduce the dimensionality of your problems. Our table's in 3D, but to analyze this beam in bending, we do a 2D beam bending calculation with a point load. Simple stuff. Never show numbers and graphics if you can avoid it. The more you leave parametric in your spreadsheet, the better. That being said, don't be scared to hard code something if you're positive it's conservative or if you think it would only waste time by making it all linked. For example, I know that this length is really only supposed to be 42 inches due to the dimensions of each leg being 3 inches, but this was faster and safer and is it good? No? Crap, alright, how about, uh, let's fix that then. How about now? No. Darn.
It's always good to try and show something good to yield, but if you need to show it good to ultimate for a high sigma load case, that's okay. So we've got our loads, our stresses, and our allowables now. Our safety factor was applied as amplification to our load, so all we have to do is show positive margin, which is where we show that the allowable load over the applied load minus one is positive, and we did it. How do you feel about that? We made a mistake. Figured I'd tell you now rather than let you wait till later to figure it out like I did when I did this for real. We may be strapped for time, but we need to slow down and show our work. Let's walk through what just happened. First, we tried to analyze a beam longer than the actual one on the table because it was easy, and if we do that, we see that it yields. Then we input the correct length of our beam, and we saw that when we do that, it still yields, but it's closer. Therefore, we had to analyze it to our ultimate allowable instead of our yield allowable, and then it showed good. We need to make sure we communicate to our designer that it has a negative margin in yield, but a positive margin in ultimate. So fine, we'll do that, but what was our mistake then? See, when we decided to say that we'd neglect the tabletop, we forgot to remember that the tabletop weighs something. If we don't include that weight on top of our final load, that would be under conservative, so we need to make sure that that quantity is reflected in our final calculations. We'll do this by just editing our loads properties table and adding the weight of the table top to our effective load, and by the power of spreadsheets, all of our calculations will just update like magic, and we're good. But wait a second, how does this work with our factor of safety? Are we supposed to multiply the weight of the table top, a hefty 501 pounds, by 5? Meaning our loads have doubled now? I don't think so. Factors of safety can be thought of as compensations for uncertainty, like how if a person dropped something on the table too hard, it could have an impact magnification factor of like five times larger than the weight of that object itself. So because there's not really any uncertainty in how much 501 pounds of steel weighs, I'll just give a disclaimer not to operate this table on any non-Earth planet and move on. Let's do the middle of the table now. I can tell just by looking at this and from experience that a safe way to analyze this table would be to call it a beam in bending. If you tried to actually analyze this thing using the theory of plates and shells rather than basic Timoshenko beam theory, you'd find that our assumption of a point load in the middle would kind of break everything. And because this thing is so thick, I can say that there's probably not going to be any membrane effects going on, meaning that our basic beam theory assumption will almost certainly be conservative. In summary, we're going to do this one just like how we did the beam before. Say it's a beam with a rectangular cross section, moment of inertia of 1 over 12 base times height cubed, where the height is the thickness of the plate, which is 1 inch, and the base is 3 feet, which is 36 inches, and is it good? Oh, it's way good. Let's move on. Load case number 3, the path of greatest stiffness, right on top of the leg, which means... Well folks, it looks like we finally got some real analysis to do. At its simplest, structural analysis is taking a load, dividing it by an area, and then making a PowerPoint slide on what areas need more, well, area. But that's only true for what we in the business refer to as compact structure, which is most of what you'd ever need to analyze in the real world. However, structures that are optimized for weight or cost or aesthetics are usually thin-walled, which means that they behave in a manner best described by the theory of elastic stability. In other words, it's pretty easy to see how many pounds it takes to break something like this, and it's only a little bit harder to predict something like this. But predicting something like these is a lot harder. I am comedically unfit to explain the underlying theory here, especially considering this is basically a speedrunning video but for math, but after reading these references, you'll know a solid 70% of what I know. But anyways, what's the problem? The problem is that if we have a column that looks like this, then we can just get the stress where it fails in compression with force divided by area, nothing too complicated. But if we have a column that looks like this, then it's gonna buckle out of the way before it fails in pure compression. And because, for our purposes, buckling means failure, we have to figure out if it's going to buckle. The challenge is not just performing a calculation, it's knowing which calculation is going to be conservative. For super long columns, we know that our boy Leonard Euler here proved that the buckling load is basically this equation. So if we're under that load with K cranked as high as it will realistically go, then we're fine, right? Fuck no, you're not. This theory is only ever remotely sound for long columns, but how long is a long column? 
Well, according to this Wikipedia page, you basically have to use Euler's formula if your slenderness ratio is over this value, and then use Johnson's formula if your slenderness ratio is under that value. This is an apocalyptically large oversimplification of what you should actually be doing, though. See how the column is failing locally on all four sides of the square tube? How the mode shapes are interacting with each other? That's because this really isn't a global column buckling phenomenon. This is a local plate buckling phenomenon, meaning I should have to go into NACA technical note 3781 page 64 table 7 row 1 to get a value of K sub C to plug into equation 26, which tells me I should instead be using equation 28, which contains a value of eta found in table 2 on page 60, which tells me I have a long column, meaning I need both the tangent modulus and the secant modulus. Oh, and the inelastic Poisson's ratio from equation 25, I can't forget about that, but that also needs the secant modulus, but I can get that from equations 22, 23, and 24. But wait, those are a function of stress, meaning that I am ultimately solving for a stress with a stress. This entire equation is a conspiracy, but that's okay because we can just go and take the advice on page 17, paragraph 1, and go to figure 4, which can be found on page 70. But that needs a number called the shape factor, which is from page 65 on table 8, and of course it doesn't have our exact material because this was written in 1957 before A36 structural steel was even standardized slash invented, but it says to plug in a value of Back up. We've forgotten to work the problem. We don't know which method of calculating the allowable is correct. We need to be less scientific about this if we want to finish this within our deadline. From prior experience, when I was doing this for real, I remembered seeing in Rourke's that the most conservative way of doing this would put the allowable about 20% over the least conservative way to do this. So that means that if I pick a method between the most and least conservative ways to do this, and I've got more than 20% margin, we're probably fine. And we're fine. Didn't really need to do any of that. Doing this analysis the wrong way was more conservative than doing it the right way. How enlightening. Let's move on. Home stretch, one failure mode left. The only joint, the weld. The part that everybody inevitably focuses on, but also inevitably screws up. Engineers screwing up the analysis of welds is a time-honored tradition. College professors love to point out that welds almost never break at the weld, despite the fact that they do, because the filler material is frequently stronger than the parent material. This is not true. In reality, you can think of a weld as a localized kind of heat damage that slowly tapers to the original heat treatment of the parent material as you get further away from the weld. My favorite reference for the basic metallurgical concept at play is actually just the section on welded joints from Mill Handbook 5J. The main issue you usually see with welds is that nearly all scientific testing is done, well, scientifically meaning you got heat-treated parts with doubly measured consistency and laboratory-grade conditions, and that's not reality. Also, you usually just see something like a weld knockdown of 20-ish percent for steels, but that's after they say they've been heat-treated, which you can almost certainly know that nobody heat-treats a fucking table. So what are we going to do? I'm going to communicate to my designer all of my assumptions because never forget that you and your designer are on the same fucking team, but I'm also going to perform my due diligence. I'm going to set up my free body diagram and draw a picture like always, but now I'm after the moment at the weld. Assuming the load is in the middle of the beam maxes out the moment that the weld will see, so that's where I'll assume the load goes. I'll also make things easy for myself by assuming the weld shape is square at first, and if this doesn't show good, then I'll also know for certain that non-square shapes absolutely won't show good. And does it show super duper good if I do this? No, it does not. So what if I actually assume the correct length of the beam by subtracting out the three inch dimension of the tube on both sides? Okay, that's fine, but it's pretty close to negative margin, meaning I need to specify that to my designer. Wow, is that it? Are we done? I guess so. But at the same time, not at all. We have no clue what this table even looks like in reality and what kind of fool would sign a drawing without confirming what the actual design looks like. 
This rampantly unprofessional video was meant to communicate a few key points. Structural analysis is best done simply and conservatively, and analysis is only ever as good as its assumptions. It's so easy to get bogged down in details, even in structures that are simple enough to be described by the most basic of drawings. And even if you think you've done everything right, it's still possible for a simple miscommunication to render your results wrong. So what would I do in this situation? Well, there's plenty of time left before 5 p.m. on Friday, so I'd send an email to the designer and to another analyst who can check my work. I'd communicate to my designer that if they think I'm going to sign off on a design before seeing it, they can go pound sand. And I'd also plot a picture of my primary cross-section as a sanity check. I'd paste that into the email, ask them where in the hell they purchased steel tubing with walls thinner than tissue paper, and... Then I'd ask them how they welded such tissue paper. But I'll ask them that in person on Monday. <laughs>